Our scripture reading comes from Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 49. Listen to and for God's word this morning. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And when he went into the Pharisee's house, he reclined to dine. And a woman in the city who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair, kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, Speak. A certain moneylender had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love, but the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. And then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? But Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. This summer, my family and I will have lived in the same house in East Liberty for 30 years. We raised all four of our kids in one house, never really intending to do that, but some I th can't remember what month it was in 1994 that we moved into our house in East Liberty. We love to host people in our home for meals and parties and events, both in our dining room table in our living room and backyard and front porch. And we've probably hosted hundreds of folks sitting at those tables and chairs over the 30 years we've uh, lived in that home with countless meals filled with beauty and goodness and life-giving conversations around that table. For about a decade or so, one of our neighbors would often show up to our house uninvited. Sometimes he would actually just walk into our house without knocking. He was often in need of something or some kind of help, and sometimes he'd show up while we were having a meal with our invited guests. And you could see them wonder quietly, never saying anything, who is this guy? Why is he here and why does he walk in so comfortably like it's his own house? And sometimes the discomfort of the social awkwardness would become palpable in the room. He was not an easy person to be around. He had some intellectual disabilities and conversation was often strained and awkward. He didn't have the culturally expected social graces and sometimes brought up awkward topics at the dinner table. And he was often in need of something. 
trouble figuring out his phone, getting food or a ride to somewhere, paying a bill, or he perpetually had broken or lost his glasses. Truth be told, when I was sitting on my porch, I would get a mild sense of dread and worry and anxiety when I would see him walking up the sidewalk. Or if I was in the kitchen and looked down the hallway and see him knocking on our door. But over time, he became a part of our family. One day, I remember walking in the house and came into the living room, and lo and behold, he's sitting there watching soccer with my twin boys. As Pastor Ralph reminded us last week, everyone needs a place to belong. Everyone needs a place to belong. Have you ever had an experience like this or similar to this where for whatever reason the person that is with you does not fit into your social or cultural norms? Do you remember how you responded to that interruption, that uninvited presence of another person? Perhaps even what happens in the room when the interruption of this person disrupts your own plans, how you're seen, and the others that are gathered around you, how they may see you and ask what in the heck is going on in this situation. The story today from Luke's gospel is one that is filled with interruptions and disruptions. Quick sidebar, we, on Thursday evenings at our soup and sustenance gathering, we are looking at the text that we'll be preaching on and having some table conversation if we feel so inclined around these stories. And my table on Thursday night had a vigorous discussion about what is the difference between an interruption and a disruption. We did not come to any answers, but I posed that question to you this morning. Now, what we think of as the private life of our homes in the modern Western world is largely unknown in the context of this story and to some extent still that way in Middle Eastern culture today. Doors would remain open, allowing extra friends or simple curious passerbys and even beggars to come into one's home. So this woman's presence was not completely out of the ordinary as we might find it in our private homes these days in the West. But regardless, this woman in this story did just that. She wandered into the home of a religious, religious leader's dinner. She enters the house as an uninvited guest. And it seems she has a very clear objective, a goal, a purpose. This woman intends to anoint Jesus' feet we learn later that this is an expression of her gratitude and love because she has received God's overflowing forgiveness. But when she finds herself before Jesus, and I invite you to enter into the scene with me for a moment. Standing before Jesus, he's reclined at a table, so he's not sitting at a chair. His feet are probably underneath him or to the side, sitting on a cushion at a table. And she's standing there, uninvited, beginning to open her alabaster jar of oil, and she begins to weep and cry. So much so that Luke tells us that Jesus' feet are wet with her tears perhaps struggling to get the jar open, overcome with emotion. And then perhaps to try to make things better, of the tears falling down her face and onto Jesus' feet, she actually makes them worse, at least from the perspective of onlookers concerned. She lets her hair down. I don't have hair to let down and demonstrate that for you this morning. But if you think of Middle Eastern culture, many women cover their heads as a sign of modesty. And she lets her hair down, something no decent woman would do in public, culturally and religiously in this time. And then she wipes Jesus' feet with her hair and kisses his feet. And then finally, perhaps collecting herself ever so slightly, doing what she came to do, she anoints Jesus' feet with oil in her alabaster jar. What do you imagine in that room in this moment? The sense of what's happening, the scene of this room. 
as it unfolds and as there is this moment of this sobbing woman with her hair down, kissing Jesus' feet, anointing his feet with oil. However we perceive Jesus to have understood Simon's thoughts, my take it on it is Jesus is reading the room, including the unspoken but tangible disdain and judgment spilling out of Simon towards him and towards this woman. If he only knew who she was, he also seemed to know the risk this woman had taken, how vulnerable and exposed she was and is in this moment among these religious men. So Jesus demonstrating his love and acceptance her, he shifts the focus, he shifts the spotlight from this woman to Simon and says, Simon, I have something to ask you. Speak, teacher, that's why you're here. There's someone who owes one guy two years worth of wages and another person who owes two months worth of wages and neither of them can pay their bill and the guy who they owe money he says don't worry about it and you tell me Simon who's going to be more loving towards that person who canceled their debt well, Simon's a smart guy he says well probably the one with the greater debt Jesus says, you have judged rightly. And then at the pinnacle of the story, I love the way Luke records this. It says, then Jesus, turning toward the woman and speaking to Simon. Turning toward the woman and speaking to Simon, he says to Simon while not looking him in the eye, do you see this woman? Do you see this woman? Do we see this woman? What, kept, what kept Simon from seeing, really seeing this woman? And what keeps us from seeing others, really seeing others? Jesus saw this woman so much so that he looks at her even when he's speaking to Simon a subtle and prophetic form of rebuke towards Simon and flipping the script of power towards the woman at the center of this story is a simple comparison between Simon and the woman Simon is the insider of the religious community of the day and the woman is the outsider been marginalized by the religious community of the day and Jesus assessment is quite simple and straightforward even though he was a guest in Simon's house the one with power the one who invited him there it was the woman who showed him radical hospitality Jesus says to Simon I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet a very common act of courtesy and welcome to wipe one's dust filled feet but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair you gave me no kiss also a common act of religious greeting even men kissing one another on the cheek but from this time I have come into the house. She has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, also a common sign of hospitality and welcome. But she has anointed my feet with oil. Check, check, check. If you're keeping score, the woman is winning. <laughs> In truly seeing this woman, Jesus not only honors her and uplifts her as the exemplar of faith, but in my opinion, he, she, he also makes her in this moment the rabbi, the teacher, the prophet, the person that Simon had brought Jesus into his house to test. And she, through her humble, vulnerable, courageous hospitality of Jesus, she demonstrates a faith that Jesus says at the very end saves her. She embodies the good news of the gospel and shows all of us what it means to be someone who follows in the way of Jesus. 
She loves deeply and follows her gut and her heart to express her affection and her gratitude for Jesus. She courageously enters a home of religious men, uninvited, to say thank you to her rabbi. And then, overcome by her gratitude, overcome by her grief, she is free enough to allow the mixture of sadness and joy to envelop her and further pour out her heart and her soul, probably knowing that this expression of deep emotion and tears and physical vulnerability is transgressing social and religious norms of everyone in the room. She is the model disciple. Jesus sees her and she sees Jesus. He sees all of this woman and he honors her faith. Jesus embodies what the psalmist says, you have kept count of my sorrows and you put my tears in a bottle. In Jesus' eyes, she was not forgotten. She was welcomed. Whatever her story was, and we do not know, and whatever the spirit stirred in her in that moment of standing in Jesus' presence, she clearly loved greatly and unashamedly and let it be seen and known in public. For she knew that though her sins were many, she was forgiven and deeply loved. And this is why, according to Jesus, she showed so much extravagance, vulnerability, and lavished love upon Jesus. And the troubling part for me, like Simon, like a religious leader who stands before you in a robe today, is that the reverse is often true. Jesus says to Simon, the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. This, my friends, is spoken to the insiders of religious institutions. Do we, the people of God, the insiders of the religious establishment of our day, do we think that we need Jesus? Or do we think that we're okay without him? Perhaps more like Simon than we care to admit. The one to whom little is forgiven loves little. It's not that Simon didn't need to be forgiven. It's that Simon didn't think he needed to be forgiven. He has been a religious leader. He stands in an inherited ethnic and religious lineage and has already been welcomed into the religious establishment by nature of his background, his privilege, and his understanding and practice of the law. And therefore, in his mind, he's already in. And he has no need of assistance, help, healing, forgiveness, kindness, mercy, or the welcome of Jesus. But this, my friends, is not the good news of the gospel, nor is it the kingdom of God that Jesus came to usher in. As Pastor Ralph preached on last week, Jesus says, it is not the healthy who need a doctor. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. If you think you are healthy, why do you need a doctor? And if you think you're righteous and moral and have it all together, what need of you of a savior named Jesus? Now I know I'm meddling here. The church in these stories, Pastor Ralph let us off easy last week. The church in these stories is almost always embodied by the Pharisees. We are more like Simon. We are here today at a religious gathering. We are the religious establishment. And we're always at risk, key phrase, at risk of being privileged insiders who have no memory or no experience of what it means to be on the outside and therefore often believe we are not in need of anything. And we often spend lots of our time and energy seeking to avoid weakness, mistakes, and asking for help. And if I'm honest with myself, 
and allow this unnamed woman to be my rabbi and my teacher today, I must ask myself the question, why don't I love Jesus the way she loved Jesus? Why is her behavior slightly embarrassing to me? Yes, my story is different, and yet I wonder what keeps me from loving Jesus in the way she loved Jesus, with courage, deep vulnerability, emotion, tears, unabandoned fervor, in a sense saying it doesn't matter what other people think. This man forgave me and being in his presence has undone me. What about you this morning? I don't know how this lands. I cannot tell you where spirit is nudging, poking, prodding in your life this morning. Let me close with this. The story ends by Jesus saying to this woman, your faith has saved you. That would be another good Thursday dinner conversation. What does that mean? Your faith has saved you. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Where does one like this woman go when Jesus tells her to go in peace? Whatever this woman's story was, the price of it to some extent was that she had been removed from any form of community. So where does she go? The one place she could probably go would be back into that community where her former way of life was alive and well and among people like herself. Again, whatever her life was, we don't know the details. But if she goes in peace to that old community, she would perhaps be in danger of falling back into some of the patterns and people who led her down a path where she didn't want to be. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Friends, this story, its ending calls to me for the existence of a community, a church, a gathering of people who are forgiven and forgiving. The story cries out for the need for a church community that says, you are welcome here. You belong here. No matter what you believe, no matter how you have behaved, you belong. A community that really sees one another, sees all of one another through the lens of love. I hope and I pray that we may continue to be humbled by this woman's story as established religious community to see all, to welcome all, and be changed by all who interrupt our life together with their extravagant, vulnerable, and lavish love of Jesus. Amen? May it be so.